Moving, thank you. Yeah, people outside, yeah. Start? Perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Hatim. I'm a primary care doctor in England um, and I'm a healthcare executive working across workforce, policy, education and training and technology and innovation. What I'm going to propose to you today is, is generative AI the panacea for health? And I want this to be very much a discussion. I want you guys to be thinking about this so that at the end of the talk, I want to hear your views. But before I do that, let me set some context. Let me set some context around some of the challenges that we face in healthcare, how we've been using classical AI today, and some example use cases where generative AI may, might help. I'm going to start by talking about the NHS. For those of us that are British, and there's a few of you in the room, the NHS is a significant part of our lives. It was founded in 1948, and it's based around core principles, seven core principles, but ultimately comes down to one or two statements. If you look at the, if you look at the NHS constitution, the first line is, the NHS belongs to the people. The second core concept of the NHS is healthcare universally accessible, free at the point of need. And to contextualize this, let me tell you about my father. So my dad arrived in the UK in the 1970s. He arrived following his, uh, his, mo his mother, who was a Ugandan refugee. And he came at the age of 17. And repeatedly in my life, he has told me this single story. He came and he said, I felt really unwell. I was incredibly breathless. There was something wrong and he had a diagnosis of a hole in his heart, which was operated at Harefield Hospital. And he holds this person in reverence as the person that saved his life, Professor Sir Magdi Yacoub, one of the world's leading cardiac cardiothoracic surgeons, who treated my father on the NHS as part of the reason why I'm here today. But irrespective of healthcare system, irrespective of healthcare delivery, what this story tells us most of all is that healthcare is so personal to us, so valuable to us, and not just ourselves, but our friends and our family. And therefore, we need to find ways to sustain good quality healthcare. However, when I'm in clinic room on a Friday, at that micro level, it's getting busier and busier. It's getting more and more unsustainable. There are some afternoons where I'm consulting with up to 30 people. Whilst consulting with 30 people, I'm balancing prescriptions, I'm balancing reading letters from the hospital, I'm supervising a team of nurses and paramedics in the community, and I leave feeling exhausted. 
And it's not just me that feels this way. This research done by the Commonwealth Fund demonstrates that doctors of my generation are increasingly feeling burnt out. I don't know what the Netherlands and Switzerland are doing. Probably need to go there and find out. But regardless, if you look at the UK, if you look at the US, almost half, or in the case of the US, at least half of doctors are reporting burnout. We need to be doing different. We also saw significant changes as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We started to finally put to the forefront some of the challenges that we have in Western society around equity. This graph from the International Monetary Fund is really interesting because it shows that countries that had larger loss of life as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic were often the richer countries. And this was because people with protected characteristics, so people with disabilities or from a minority ethnic background, were much more likely, up to four times more likely, to be hospitalized and die as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We also know that the population is growing infinitely. The baby boomer generation, any of you in the room, are tru truly mean that as a result of that generation, there's going to be an imbalance between our population. Based on our modeling, we expect the population of over 65s to double by 2035. And what does that mean? That means a significant part of the population will be reliant on health and care. And the people that are part of the working age generation will be, looked at, will be looking after this generation. It also means that health is becoming more complex. This graph, or this image, takes us through to 2040. And it shows the increased prevalence of disease that is going to be facing our societies. Increased chronic pain. Increased diseases like cardiovascular disease. Increased anxiety and depression. Increased cancer. One in five adults in England will have a non-communicable illness by 2035. Now, in healthcare, particularly in Western societies, we work towards a certain framework of what we define as a good health and care system. Previously known as the quadruple aim, the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and other bodies have now expanded it to, to make it the quintuple aim, including it health equity. And it takes into account various things. What is the experience of the person going through that system? What about the people that actually deliver the healthcare? What is their well-being? How do we make sure that we protect all of our people, all of our citizens, and have an equitable health system? How do we reduce costs? Now, I think reduce costs is a difficult question because the reality is we're not going to reduce costs. But how do we contain costs? And how do we deliver preventative health care? For too long, we've been doing sick care. We need to move to health care, preventing disease in the first place. So in 2019, I was part of some work led by Dr. Eric Topol. He's the director of the Scripps Institute in Loyola in California. And he was asked by our Secretary of State for Health and Social Care to paint a vision for the future of the NHS. What technologies might we be using, and how will we adapt to those technologies? And in his letter to the Health Secretary, he wrote, we are at a unique juncture in the history of medicine. The convergence of the genomics, biosensors, the electronic patient record, and smartphone applications, all superimposed on digital infrastructure with AI to make sense of that overwhelming amount of information. A remarkable set of technologies that allows us to understand, from a medical standpoint, the uniqueness of each individual, and the promise to deliver healthcare at a far more rational, efficient, and tailored basis. I believe in that vision. I believe that we can use technology to finally move towards true healthcare that is personalized to the individual. And so why AI? Well, firstly, I described what I'm doing to you on a Friday when I'm in clinic. I need new tools. I need things that are going to help make my job easier and more efficient. So I'm not as exhausted by the end of the day. We also know that society is more connected. There's a graph, wonderful graph from Hootsuite in, in 2018 that they put out, which shows that the amount of 
devices that people are connected to in areas like Northern Europe out supplies the amount of people that live in Northern Europe. So if there's that much connectivity out there, we must utilize it. There's also an exponential rise in medical knowledge. Medical knowledge is now doubling every 60 days in terms of published literature. How do you keep up with that level of evidence? When I went to medical school, one of the first things that was, that was taught to me was practicing evidence-based medicine. If I'm going to continue to do that and provide the best level of practice, I need a way to keep up with this overwhelming amount of knowledge and evidence that's coming through. We have much more data. We have data at scale. And we should be able to utilize that data to give us actionable intelligence to allow us to make population-based decisions. And finally, I talked about workforce burnout. But who cares for the people that care for the nation? We need to utilize technology to make people's jobs easier and to retain staff in healthcare. Our modeling in the NHS demonstrates that by 2035, our workforce will be 300, 360,000 people short. And this is one of the largest employers in the world. The American Hospital Association, in the middle of the pandemic, forecasted that they'll have a critical workforce shortage of 3.2 million by 2026. One of the benefits of that is when people tell me about generative AI taking jobs, I say, we don't have enough people anyway, so we need to find ways to be different. So, in the NHS, we've had an interesting journey with AI so far. And um, I sit on the, law, on the board of the NHS AI Lab, and in 2020, this was established by the government to help scale and roll out AI technologies, and most importantly, help evaluate them. <coughs> At the moment, we have around 80 live projects in 400 settings across hospitals and primary care providers. And they're demonstrating really positive results in certain areas. Areas like lung cancer screening, being able to diagnose the disease earlier, particularly because in the UK we're falling further and further behind in early diagnosis and outcomes. <coughs> areas like stroke, we know that we can use imaging to diagnose stroke much more quickly with AI. And this is imperative in stroke because you've got a six hour window to start treatment for the best outcomes. In dermatology, we're able to pick up skin cancers through people taking photos on their phones and be able to triage pay people to the right person at the right time to have their treatment as soon as possible or to be reassured. A year in, in January of last year, we published the AI Roadmap. This was a publication that allowed us to understand where AI technologies currently sit within the NHS either in deployment or in, due to be in deployment within the next five years, and particularly look at what taxonomies they sit within. And then also, from my point of view, really look at what, how will that impact the workforce in the future. Because there's been some conversation today and yesterday around how we reskill people, and that is critical. We might not need as many radiologists, but more importantly, we probably will need as many radiologists and be utilizing their skills in a different way. Perhaps more interventions, for example. And so we found 34% of the technologies, and we found 240 in total at the time, were diagnostic. So again, in that imaging space or in home diagnostics. We also found 29% of technologies in automation and service efficiency. There's been a lot of talk around how we make things better, how we increase productivity. Well, even in classical AI, there are technologies in this space. But what really excites me is these group of technologies after this. People, medicine, personalized, preventative, predictive, and participatory, and remote monitoring, and to some extent therapeutics, that allow us to treat people at home, allow us to keep people in the community, release the burden on our hospitals and on our services. These technologies will allow us to do preventative healthcare if we utilize them correctly. And then we come to generative AI. So this paper was published by Eric Topol and uh, Harvard professor uh, uh, Pranav, I think it is, uh, who leads the AI lab over here, and amongst others. And it demonstrates the role of generative AI and how it transforms this kind of existing infrastructure that we already have in healthcare and allows us to do much more in a true multimodal fashion. Building on what we already have in terms of images, bringing together the information in our electronic healthcare records, also thinking about the information that we have in our omics, 
using text, audio, building on existing evidence that exists in publications, in literature, in grey literature, and utilising all of this to come up with some certain use cases where we think generative AI will transform the way we do things. And some of these use cases are in action. So chatbots for patients. And I'll give you an example of a, a case study we've been working up uh, shortly. But also, can it actually augment surgical procedures? So for example, when a surgeon is out there in practice, generative AI is able to say, well, have you considered this or have you done this? And particularly in the surgical education and training, that could have a massive impact. What about note taking? I have 10 minutes to consult with my patients. Within that 10 minutes, I need to finish my consultation and I need to document my notes. Can't that happen in the background while I'm speaking to the individual? Nuance have done some work in this area. They've done some research that shows that a third of all activity amongst healthcare professionals is a mixture of documentation and paperwork. And that the average healthcare professional spends three hours of overtime because of this. They found that the role of generative AI and ambient AI in this space can reduce that workload by 50%. Radiology reports. We've got to a place where we've built these imaging platforms. And in, in, in the UK, we have in our AI center for value-based healthcare, we have a federated imaging platform and a federated AI deployment engine for the reading of images. But when are we going to be able to go down that cycle from being able to look and read images to be able to actually report on images? And generative AI allows us to do this. To not only, autonomous, or, or, to not only use automation to read the x-ray, but to provide a report at the end of it back to the healthcare professional. It finally allows us to get closer to that. There's some talk around the use of generative AI to help with protein and, and, and another biological sequencing. And then the area of bedside clinical decision support or in-clinic decision support. A study which was done internationally found that about 48% of healthcare professionals want clinical decision support powered by artificial <coughs> intelligence. And that could be game-changing. But there are still critical factors in the use of generative AI at the bedside or with the healthcare professional. How do we know we can trust it? How do we protect our liability? What about biases? We already have cognitive biases in the way we do things and the decisions that we make. To impose on that automation bias, what further complexity does that bring? We've done some really interesting work on human AI interaction with one of our regulators to look at interpretability and explainability. We found that most of the time, for the, for the small sample that we've tested, people are quite responsive to artificial intelligence, giving them some feedback. And we also found that the AI and the human look at different things. The humans are very consistent in the type of risk factors for cardiovascular disease that they look at typical kind of top three risk factors. The AI was much more broader in its decision making. So clearly, we can augment. Um, Simon, you talked about it earlier. We can augment the work that we do with decision support. But we need more of a research in that human AI interaction environment. Another area where generative AI can play a huge part is self-care. And this isn't a new concept. So traditionally, healthcare has been patriarchal. I'm the doctor, and I'll tell you what to do. But we've moved away from that for decades now. In 1990, Tom Ferguson presented this flip chart of actually people make their decisions by the conversations they have with their family about their health, by what they read up online about their health. And so by the time they come to me as a healthcare professional, they already have an idea of what they expect. They already have a sense of what they want. And I'm not afraid of people saying, I looked this up on Google. In fact, I welcome people saying to me, I looked this up. Because it helps me understand what worries them. It helps me understand what investigations might be helpful. It helps me come to a plan that is truly collaborative. And the more and more access to knowledge that people have, the less and less the role that we play as healthcare professionals in terms of diagnosing. But we are translators of that knowledge. 
we know how things work. We understand the repercussions of what the options might be in terms of treatment. And therefore, we can work collaboratively with people to take them through those steps. There's been a lot of talk about safety. And next week, we've got this AI Safety Summit in England at Bletchley Park at the home of Alan Turing. Sadly, I'm not one of those 100 important people that are going to be in that room. Having said that, on Monday, I will be in 10 Downey Street talking to our health secretary and a bunch of other experts about how we do speed up the use of AI in diagnosis and how we support our workforce to do that. So whilst there's a, there is a concern around the safety aspect, I do believe we are going to try and look actively at how we utilize this technology meaningfully. There's a clear push over the last few years, over the last year in particular, but particularly since the emergence of ChatGPT, from our politicians to scale this effectively. But we have to be careful. We have to be responsible. Because there are always going to be unintended consequences. Let's look at vapes, for example. I'm watching a documentary about Joel. Uh, innovation that had a significant impact and has had a significant impact in stopping millions of adults from smoking that has now found its way in the hands of children, teenagers. Last Friday I was in clinic, I had a 13 year old in my clinic who was addicted to vaping and now had a chronic cough. So we can see what the repercussions are if we don't get it right. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't innovate, but we should do it responsibly. So now let me take you through a case study. So last year we did a piece of work called One Size Doesn't Fit All. And we did this with Pfizer and the National Innovation Center for Aging in England to look at medicine's information. Now hands up in the room. How many of you, when you've been prescribed a medication or picked up a medication from your pharmacy, have read the leaflet that exists within that box? Few. And that's what our research showed. 13% of people actually read that information. And of that 13% that actually bothered to read the information, only 32% answered that they fully understood the information that existed in that leaflet. And then 77% of people are looking for this information online. Or 71% of the people are trying to access a healthcare professional for advice. And I have this all the time. I have a patient come back to me one or two months later. And they say, doctor, you, you prescribed this medication, but I was worried about the side effects. Or I was worried about this interaction, so I didn't take it. And here I am two months later saying to them, no, please take it. <laughs> it's absolutely fine. But they had to wait two months for that conversation. And it led to a delay in their treatment. So how can we do this better? And as a result of this report, we've now got a task force with our Association of British Pharmaceutical Industry to look at, with our regulators, to look at with pharma, how we can do this differently. Because one, we've got to change regulation. At the moment, regulation says there needs to be a leaflet in the box. And there's a clear learning from this in terms of the kind of challenges that we'll have to overcome with AI. But anyway, we had a startup called Trustwise on our industry and innovation program that saw this report and said, oh, this is great. Let's take this away. Let's work with this. And so we accessed open source data sets of Kaggle, which brought in lots of medicines information from kind of all across the world. Um, and we also built in some NHS leaflets onto it around specific areas like liver disease and, and post-liver transplantation, just to run an experiment and see what happened. So my experiment is nowhere near as exciting as Nick's, um, or aesthetically pleasing as Nick's. <laughs> but <laughs> here we are on Hugging Face, starting to play around with a couple of models. And I will dive deeper so you'll be able to see it a little bit better. But from a, from a global perspective, on the left you have Vicuna, so we've been a lot of conversation about that as a, as a large language model. And on the right, you have a, a healthcare falcon kind of fine-tuned LLM done by the team at Trustwise. And you can see on the left there are hallucinations, clear hallucinations around dosage, around pharmaceutical misinformation, around just posing the wrong medication altogether. So let's dive deeper into those hallucinations. So the first question we asked it off the back of this was, what is the NHS recommended dosage for acetaminophen? Now it's an international data set and actually people here will be more comfortable with acetaminophen. Simon will say we should be talking about paracetamol. But it, that shows how important the data is. The patient is a 23-year-old male with a previous condition of asthma. 
And the information it gives back is entirely not useful. The NHS recommended dosage for acetaminophen is one tablespoon per day. <laughs> then we say, well, what should I take if I don't have acetaminophen? If you don't have acetaminophen, take a pain reliever such as codeine. <laughs> I wouldn't say codeine is the next best thing to take. <laughs> Finally, what are the NHS recommended medicines for a patient that just underwent a liver transplant? The NHS recommends medicines for a patient that just underwent a liver transplant are Bevacizumab, which is an immunomodulator, and Rivaroxaban. Neither of those medications would be recommended. <laughs> so now, the team at Trustwise put some guardrails on this, and you can see you get better responses. So in that first question around the dosage of paracetamol or acetaminophen, <coughs> it says 16 years and over should take 500 to 1,000 milligrams of acetaminophen up to four times a day with a maximum of four grams a day. And that is the correct dosage. It also suggests that people with asthma should take less. Not inappropriate. Then it says, well, if I don't have acetaminophen, what do I take? It says you can take ibuprofen or naproxen as an alternative. However, it is always best to consult with your doctor before taking any medication to ensure the dosage and the medication are appropriate for your individual needs. That sentence is incredibly important. And ibuprofen is appropriate as a second-line medication for pain relief. Naproxen, so not so much. We would have to prescribe that, at least in England. Um, but at least it's pointing people in the right direction. And then the final one about the liver transplant, well, it says take a combination of immunosuppressants, where it gives examples, like tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and prednisolone, which are sensible examples, but it's not defining which one you should take. And it also says, and it explains why, so these drugs are there to help prevent the body from rejecting the new liver. And other medications may be prescribed um, for side effects, such as antacids, anti-nausea medications, and antibiotics. Again, very sensible response. So you can clearly see a difference between what happens with a large language model without any guardrails and one that has been fine-tuned to an extent. And this is a technical paper. And look, I'm a medic, by no means a technician, so be kind to me. But um, that starts to explore some of the protocol to, to how the team at Trustwise have built this with researchers at Cambridge, the Turing Institute, and us at NHS England. Um, and the SHARP protocol, which is a smart hallucination assessment and uh, response protocol, incorporates things like using external sources of knowledge. And it also looks at the data context, the, uh, the suitability of the data, its origins, and what it represents. As I said, by no means a technical expert, but happy to share the paper afterwards if you reach out to me. And so, we need to be moving towards a, a do tank. We need to be starting to actually utilize and test this technology. And we've been having conversations with the Responsible Artificial Intelligence Institute, who have created this blueprint for a generative AI testbed. And it's been really useful to hear around the room and the conversations that have been made by other guests around education, because that's where this critically starts. You know, this meeting is a pure example of that. Increasing our knowledge of the technology is essential. And this is something that we've been really moving forwards with, particularly in the NHS. We know from one of our think tanks, the Health Foundation, that people that are more familiar with AI are more likely to be net positive with it, about AI. To the extent, I think, from the data, it suggests that People that are familiar, rated themselves as familiar, were 80%, 80 of those people were positive about AI. For those that were unfamiliar, only 30% were positive about AI. So when we talk about culture, Simon, you asked about this earlier, you change culture by educating. You change culture by making people understand what it does. You change culture by breaking some of the myths that exist around this technology. The second part is, you need to apply it. Now, I heard this from Simon. You need to apply it. You need to test it somewhere. We need to adopt it. You're 100% right. But also, as I described earlier, there are inherent risks in healthcare where you could potentially cause harm. So how do you do that in a safe way? And so, so one of the things that we're looking to do in England is utilize our data environments, our secure data environments, where we have built on real-world patient data, anonymized data sets. And this allows us to test some of these models and algorithms. And we've already done this regardless with classical AI. So we've done this with 
um, some models around falls risk and around identifying people's comorbidities, so how many diseases they have altogether. Um, and we've built these models and put them out, in, and now we're at a stage where actually the, the, the health system are saying to us in, in, in the southeast of England, well, we want to use this. So we've built this on an unwise data, but how do we go out and use this? Well, now we know it's up to a certain level of practice, a practice that actually meets what's out there in the literature. We feel comfortable in saying, we've built a model in this safe environment. Let's put it to practice. Let's validate it with real-life patients. So we need to start testing this. We need to create that environment where we can test it. And then finally, we've talked about regulation. And regulation is complex. It's all the way from <coughs> general regulations like the EU AI Act and the stuff that the ICO puts out to industry-specific regulation. So of course you have the FDA over here. In the UK we have our Medicines, Health and Regulatory Authority and we also have bodies like our National Institute for Health and Care Excellence that have all come together to form this AI and Digital Health Regulation Service to signpost people through this and also think about how we get early value assessment. So what evidence do you need as early as possible? Because we don't need randomised controlled trials all the time. But we do need to start creating and collecting and testing at an early stage in safe environments. So from the stuff that we can do elsewhere around education and innovation, we can then advocate for change and further change in the way we regulate these technologies. You know, I'm really interested in how we collaborate from an international point of view in regulating technology. Because we'll be looking at similar principles in the UK to what my friends over here in the FDA are looking at. And similarly, I've had conversations across this on, on, with various other countries. So we need to advocate for change in the way we regulate. Professional regulation is a big problem. Because what happens when if you're using a tool like this and it makes a mistake, who's liable? I'm a regulator by the General Medical Council and I've had conversations with them. They're absolutely not ready for this. Having said that, they will know they need to be thinking about it and they have started thinking about it. So being able to bring out real life use cases and then show that to the regulators. So they start thinking about the challenges and the problems that it poses so that we're not always waiting, waiting for case law before we sort out regulation and the people aren't coming to harm in the first place. So let's bring it back to that quintuple aim. I truly believe that generative AI can help us unlock it. I don't believe that it's the single answer. Innovation is complex and incorporates multiple facets. But clearly, it will have a role. It will have a role in enhancing the health and care experience so that people can be more supported in their homes, can have quicker diagnosis and more personalised treatment. It will improve workforce well-being so that I'm not spending lots of time writing letters, documenting, but actually more time with my patients. And actually, maybe time to go for the bath to the bathroom and have some lunch. That would be nice. <laughs> Advancing health equity. I truly believe that if we do this right with the right data, with real life data sets that are built fairly, transparently, we can lead to better population based insights that improve the lives for all, not just for some. Reducing cost. There's no question, you know, in, in, a, in an NHS long term workforce plan, which we published about a few months ago, where we made an ambition towards 2% productivity in the NHS every year, we can do this with generative AI if we're smart about it. We might not make the full 2%, but we can make inroads to that 2%. Because like I said, it's a multifaceted world. And we can improve population health. We genuinely can reach what Dr. Eric Topol described in terms of personalised healthcare. Rational, tailored to all our needs. So, I'm going to leave you with this. I asked mid-journey, not the greatest prompt, but anyway, a futuristic doctor's clinic room with a doctor and a patient. And this is what we got back, and there's tremendous issues with this, with this photo, clearly. But for me, there's one prevailing message in this photo. How can we create an environment where integral to the future of healthcare is the human part? That connection between the healthcare professional and the person that they're looking after is enhanced. Rather than looking at a computer screen, I'm looking at that person. That's where I want you to think about where we can go with the use of this technology. So thank you for listening, and any questions?
Thanks for a talk. That was uh, awesome. I guess um, you painted a vision of like how all this could work, and th there's like a today where we are, and then where you want to go. Like, what is the next big role? Like, like what should we solve next? Right? Because uh, some of the preliminary testing looks good, all of that. But like, what are the things we need to solve next to actually push this forward? Because I mean, the vision sounds great and important. So I think we actually have the infrastructure now. Okay. Okay. I think we have electronic healthcare records in about 95% of our hospitals. We have better use of technology. We might not have the right skills within our workforce. I mean, we still know that 25% of society has low digital capability, and that will transcend into the workforce itself. So clearly we need to do more in terms of building the skills and the confidence in our workforce to be able to utilize the technology. So that may be one thing that we need to address. Um, and we also just need to start with what I describe as frictionless applications. So where generative AI is now is where AI imaging was about five years ago. It's going to take that long to get through this regulatory journey. In the meantime, we can use it for purposes that are not patient-facing or decision-making. So not classified as a medical like device workflow, as a result. Like workflow, like back-end workflow. Exactly. We can release, we can use it to, to start to, to improve HR processes. We can use it to, to start improving pathways that we use. And we can use it for documentation, as I described. You know, summarizing notes, summarizing information. I get thousands, we get thousands and thousands of letters from our hospitals in, in my clinic. You know, being able to go through that information takes a lot of time. We can improve pathways like that. We can make lives easier for our receptionists, for administrators. So I would say, and the other area where I think you can use it right away is education and training. Because again, you're not patient facing. There is a level of regulation in edu education and training, but it's not as strict as regulation in actual healthcare delivery. So you can start to get medical students and other healthcare students using it to enhance their knowledge and experiences. Um, we do a lot of reflecting, you know, being able to reflect with the tool itself. What kind of things should I have considered with this person? We have to be very careful around confidentiality. Absolutely cannot be putting patient information into these large language models. But with the right guidance, the right policies, the right support, I think in education and training can have a tremendous impact. I mean, even the, the ability to, to have synthetic um, patient scenarios um, to simulate that environment you know, could be tremendous. And, I, and I, again, that's where I would start. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, I have a lot of friends who are doctors, mm -hmm. and you know, they, and I have my own doctors, and they're so stressed out, right? Yeah. And so, um, and I just think like in a capitalist society, like that's not gonna stop, right? Mm -hmm. They're gonna just squeeze the value out of the doctors as much as they can, and that's where I, AI becomes really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, like, but I think AI alone is, you know, you need a person like to kind of guide you. Do you do, do you or kind of government entities that you work with, are you anticipating a new kind of field of like, you know, non-physicians interpreting AI to help other people? So there's been a lot of work in the UK about expanding the healthcare workforce, um, reflecting on roles like physicians and associates or physician assistants that you, you know you have over here, advanced nurses um, who increase their skill sets. Um, and empowering people like radiographers as well to, to do more reporting. So I do believe that we'll do more in terms of having, it doesn't always have to be the doctor that's picking up that slack or picking up that workload. Um, I will challenge you a little bit on that assumption around capitalist societies not really you know, supporting our physicians to, uh, to release some of that stress and burnout. Because I think reality is we won't retain our workforce if we don't look after them. Yeah. And so, and, and, and every bit of evidence, even from an economic point of view, demonstrates that actually the more you look after your people, your workforce, and, you know, I think this is inherent in any industry, the better you will perform as an organization. So I think there will be an element of, of course, you know, we've got this technology, it augments the work that you do, maybe, maybe you can see a few more patients, maybe. But I think the first things we need to figure out is actually sorting out things like absenteeism, you I know, mean, being able to actually go to the bathroom, have a good meal, and um, being able to finish on time. You know, those sorts of things I think are gonna prevail first yeah. um, because that's the problem with healthcare at the moment. Yeah, I just wonder if it's like past <coughs> rabbit for medicine is gonna happen, you know, and you can just ask your neighbor to come over and help you out with some stitches because they can do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just think that's something to look for.
It is. I th I look, I think there's, a, there's, there's tremendous potential of this technology, and it could open up skills among citizens that they would not normally have. And I do believe in empowering as many people as possible to, to self-care. You know, we don't always need to see a doctor. And actually, what you'd rather your doctor be dealing with is the complexity of where their skill set comes in. You know, we talk a lot about kind of working at the top of your license. And so there will be an element. And then the other area, actually, where that's really interesting is remote and rural populations. Because we know for a fact, and um, there's a really interesting report that was published by our chief medical officer for England, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, um, a few years ago on remote and rural populations. And it found that our coastal populations and our rural populations in England have, um, have a similar level of poverty as developing countries. And so, clearly, these and, and have a, a, a huge variation in the, the availability of healthcare. So, for those populations, you can see tremendous impact of this type of technology, supporting them and supporting those underserved communities. So, I'd hope that actually we can do that in certain places. <coughs> um, we have to remember also that health literacy is a big problem. You know, yeah, people really struggle with with, with general literacy. I mean, the average reading age in England is eight or nine. And, and, and also health literacy itself then transcends that, and then you've got digital literacy on top of that. So we have to also understand that, yes, we can empower people, but we are going to need to educate them as well. Um, and I truly believe that healthcare professionals should play a big part in that. Sure. I'll take one online and I'll go back to the room. Um, in healthcare and mental health, practitioners are required to have certifications, attend medical school, and so on. What certifications must AI complete to perform the functions of a practitioner? That's a great question, and that's exactly the type of question that our regulators are working with. So the research that I was talking about earlier about interpretability and explainability, that's with one of our regulators, the MHRA. Um, and what they want to know is, what should they be looking for with the technology in terms of what it demonstrates, what it gives feedback, etc. And what we want to know is, how does that change the interaction between the, the physician and, and, and the patient? Um, there are quite clear guidance at least I've seen from the FDA and also from, from our regulators around what needs to be overcome to, to be able to regulate this technology and use it efficiently. So it does have certification. It does have things that you have to meet before you can roll it out in, in, in true scale and true adoption. And so I'll be very clear, if you're working in this space, look at that. Look up the AI and Digital Health Regulation Service in the UK. Look at the information that the FDA has put out there and start to understand at what points you need to build that right evidence to be able to meet that certification. Uh, questions in the room. I'll go deeper. So uh, you mentioned this earlier, and I think that's very true, that a lot of the Gen AI use cases are for preventative health care. And then you mentioned self-care. I think, you know, both of those are uh, perfect examples. But in the US, and I don't know how it is in the UK, the insurance industry is not motivated towards preventative health care or self-care, it's, it's very much treatment-based. So I'm wondering if there's anyone here from the insurance industry, or if you know, like, what does the insurance industry think of this? I want to share Thank an you. example. <laughs> I, I just moved from Europe to the US, and it's incredible to see how many commercials you have yeah. on medicine. There's a lot of it in Europe. There is such a big claim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, I mean, it's a, it's a commercially generated claim on healthcare, mm -hmm. that I think that is part of the biggest problem. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not a medic. My, my parents were medics, but uh, I'm not a medic, but it's, it's culture. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Um, there's such a huge demand on healthcare in this country. Yeah. And creation. Yeah. And a creation. Yeah. There, there's exactly. demand, there's demand development. Like yeah. The need for something that wasn't there. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I will say on self-care is the ability for people to have more information and more accurate information to make decisions at home means that they get to the right treatment quicker. And it reduces steps in the process, which I think will be interesting to insurers because it means that they have to spend less money on delivering healthcare. Um, it may also and get people quicker to the point of actually having a procedure or having a treatment, which actually then generates money for them. Um, and also particularly for things like the, the, the pharmacy industry and the kind of over-the-counter treatments that people can access. You know, you can get 
more and more people thinking about the right types of treatments to go and have conversations with their local pharmacy or with their local healthcare professional. And so they, you might argue that actually increased self-care drives, again, more activity in healthcare. And the reality is it does. Um, we know that actually a lot of the work that we've done in England, and, and the reason why there's often a lot of challenge around innovation in technology, is because where we have used techno technological tools like e-consultation tools to allow people to fill out information uh, you know, at midnight while they're in bed, um, that then reaches their doctor the next morning, is that actually that creates more demand often, and we haven't been able to keep up with that demand. So part of the problem is that we need to transform the way we actually do things to be able to deal with the level of demand that might come through as you utilize the technologies in a more effective way um, and triage people better as well. And that's where automation and AI can have a tremendous impact as well. Um, I, mean, I obviously don't work in this healthcare system. I'm fascinated by it. And of course, you do have things like Medicare and Medicaid, where actually you can see tremendous improvements um, in creating more equity in the way you deliver your healthcare in this country. Um, I have no doubt, though, that the insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry and kind of the general healthcare provider industry are going to be actively looking at generative AI and thinking about how it helps them in the same way that it, has, it helps any business. Right, we're out of time. Out of time? Sorry. No worries. Feel free to come and grab me. Okay. Uh, we're going to take one hour break. Uh, the launch is provided. Uh, you'll be outside. There are box launch, so feel free to take those. Uh, and then we're going to come back out 2.15. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Outside. Yeah. Recording stopped. <laughs>